Welcome to the MI Honey Podcast. On this episode, we're going to celebrate the 4th of July and talk about summer projects and to-do lists to get ready for the upcoming hunting season. All right, welcome to the MI Honey Podcast. And yes, happy 4th of July weekend, everyone. Hope everyone's having a fun and safe holiday. I don't know. This for this year, it this Fourth of July feels like it's needed. It feels like I don't know. With everything that's going going on, really the past couple years and this year as well, things have just I don't know. It's been tough, you know, throughout the country and having this Fourth of July weekend really feels like a good way to kind of recenter and you know, kind of get back to bases of, I don't know, like I'm going on a bit of a tangent here already, but it's nice to be able to reflect on some good things and things to look forward to with this holiday weekend. I'll just say that. So with this episode, again, it's, I mean, it's been a while since I've recorded an episode. Uh, it's been a crazy month. June was a very, very busy time. Uh, there was a lot of times where I wanted to sit down and do a recording and it felt like I just didn't have the time for it. Uh, I mean, I've, I've been able to get out and do a lot of things in the outdoors and but just to be able to actually sit down and document it and, you know, have, have something that felt like it was worth talking about. Uh, it just never really seemed to come together. So f- for the first episode for the month of July, you know, just kind of go over how or what what has been going on the month of June Um, you know did get a lot of projects done uh, but I do feel like I'm behind the eight ball a little bit on things that I need to get done yet to get ready for hunting season really so I mean really just go back to the first of the month there uh, I mean I you know I did go to the toll archery challenge that was held at Crystal Mountain Resort you know that was an absolute blast you know i i had a feeling it was going to be good now part of me was a little little concerned or i guess maybe a little bit up of the unknown that you know because of it being such a huge event that i thought it might be you know kind of high pressure you know that maybe it was like a really fast pace and that you felt like you're pressured to hurry up and i don't know maybe it was as if you don't feel very structured where you couldn't just kind of hang out relax that was not the case at all. It was a very, very chill event. I mean, it seemed like everyone was in great spirits. Everyone was having a great time. I mean, even even when things went bad in regards to sometimes some of the shuttles were taking a while or, you know, people were losing or breaking arrows or, you know, getting stuck in the swamp and stuff like that. I mean, it was everyone was having just a good time. Um regardless of the situation really which is great and that's what i was hoping for so you know i really don't think i'm gonna miss out on a total archer challenge again because it is an absolute blast it's great to meet people talk to people met met a lot of great people from different parts of the country different parts of the state you know there's plenty of vendors there you know got to meet up with uh, a couple i was pretty excited about which I'll get into some of those products that uh, that I'm going to kind of promote here on this episode, uh, just because I've you know switched over to them and I'm really liking how they're performing. Well, we'll get to that a little bit later. But yeah, I got to meet up with a couple of people. You know, got to meet meet up with Chris Queen, uh, host of Trekking Outdoors. Got to meet up with him, chat with him a bit. You know, he's such a great guy. He's always fun to really talk to. He was. Uh, basically meeting up with uh, a winner of a contest that he had uh, done with uh, Vantage Point Archery. Uh, he partnered up with them, and they're doing a hunt giveaway. And the winner of that hunt got to come and shoot the Total Archery Challenge with them. So they did some documentation of that as well. So it was cool to meet up with Chris and then meet the team um, that's partnered up with him at Vantage Point Archery. Got to talk with them quite a bit, and they're actually, well, I guess I'll get into it now, they are the company that I'm going to go with for my, basically my broadhead setups, probably from here on out. Uh, 
you know, basically they have the probably the largest selection of fixed blade broadheads uh, on the market. You know, they have anything from, you know, 100 grain up to 300 grain. They have vented, non vented, two blade, three blade, uh, single bevel, double bevel. And again, almost in every array of, you know, grain weight that you would need. They've got them in, you know, the different types of steel, you know, you know, premium tool steel, high carbon steel. I do believe they even still got some uh, stainless steel broadheads as well. Don't quote me on that because that's one thing I haven't really looked into because I uh, I'm focusing on that high carbon steel because um, I want something that's really tough and it's gonna hold a good edge. So that's what I'm going with. They have different, you know, essentially different size cutting diameters, which. Again, I'll dive into that a little bit with my aero setup that I've I've tweaked it again a little bit this year, but I've I'm pretty sure I've got the best aero setup um, for my bow setup that I could possibly get. So we'll get into that. But yeah, that's a great crew with Vantage Point Archery. Again, if you're looking for broadheads, and if you're really um, you know really set on shooting a different or a certain style, go check them out because they're gonna have more than likely what you're looking for then what else i've been doing quite a bit of work down at the farm uh you know end of or middle of the end of may i did get basically my summer slash cover crop or summer food plot slash cover crop planted now uh it's doing all right i mean in the top field uh, down the property uh it's doing pretty good the buckwheat is coming up quite a bit the clover's coming in some of that sorghum is showing up as well some of the sun hemp that i planted in that top field i don't really see that coming up all that well unfortunately though too down the farm they're doing some work around the pond and building up the roadway uh, because it always got really muddy and really hard to you know get down through it so they're doing some work there had a bulldozer there moving some ground around so i think that might have disturbed that uh, ground enough to where some of that stuff that I planted, um, you know, where the trailhead is, is gotten beat up a little bit. So, but the buckwheat is doing really good. Now, again, for that, typically what I would do is let that grow up for another about four weeks or so and then terminate that. But I was informed that the, that there's going to be someone probably looking to plant corn on that top field next year so it sounds like they're wanting to put some rye in this fall so more than likely i'm not going to be planting anything in that top field like i had planned which i guess isn't necessarily a bad thing because the price of seed and fertilizer and everything like that has gotten kind of starting to get a lot of, a little out of control uh especially that fertilizer so you know the fact that i'm not going to be planting as much as i anticipated uh, I guess my bank account is going to thank me for that. Uh, but we'll just have to see, you know, if that fall stuff stays up or if they do plant that rye, you know, that's going to be basically a food plot for me as well anyways. Uh, and if they don't, then the buckwheat and the clover and the sorghum and everything like that that I have planted, uh, it will start to seed out and that, you know, at least that buckwheat and the sorghum will seed out. Clover will be there and you can never go wrong with clover, so down to the bottom field well i kind of like what i talked about a little bit we've got some well we got weeds and grasses growing in now part of it is because of the lowland area it's basically down on the lower portion of the farm it's very wet soil kind of doesn't have very good drainage so we do have that horsetail Again, that's something that's probably not going to be taken care of with glyphosate. So I am going to have to use a little bit more heavy duty herbicide. Again, I don't know if I'm going to use that heavier herbicide this year because I'm probably going to use some 2,4-D and that can actually stay in the ground for a while. So I might just try to kind of choke out that weed this year and then try to really attack it next year, uh, next spring really to make sure it doesn't come up. But I do have some big time grass coming in and parts where I guess really the seeds didn't really uh, take all that well, I guess. It kind of seems that way or that they've kind of getting uh, overtaken by that grass. Now that grass, is, I'm assuming, is coming up because 
of having tilled that bottom field a little bit last year. I broke up that ground, you know, kind of circulated those potential seeds. And now this grass is coming up that, you know, basically kind of I missed it when I initially sprayed and then it started coming up after that when I planted. So, but with that, it's not going to be a total loss because it, it is going to grow in and it basically kind of, well, I'll be able to spray it when I plant here in August with the next seed that I'm going to be planting. Now, since we're on the talking about the food plots and everything like that, I am actually going to go with a new company for my fall seed blend. You know, I had talked about how I've been you know, playing around with doing my own blends. But part of the downfall of me doing that was, you know, I had the idea of exactly what types of plants I wanted, but to be able to get the ratio of the correct amount of seed to have proper coverage on, you know, per acre, essentially, I was more or less kind of guesstimating or estimating or, you know, just kind of going by what it felt like what should have been the correct, you know, amount per acre of each different type of seed. You know, last year it turned out it worked out pretty good, but that's that part of it really stressed me out to try to get that ratio and you know the correct coverage so you know catching up on some of the podcasts i listened to you know i was listening to the habitat podcast you know that's another uh, michigan podcast and you know jared who is the host there partnered up with a gentleman down in came up with their own seed plant so and i hope to uh, get uh, you know either jared the host of the podcast or albert who is his partner to come on the show uh, because i'm very excited about that blend they basically are doing exactly what i was trying to do but they're they're just doing it better you know they came up with a very um you know thought out blend of making sure that you get certain plants that work together well plants that help build up the soil help improve soil and also that are going to be benefited from deer and wildlife and then they basically create a two-step program quite similar to what i'm trying to do here where they have a blend that's going to basically get you ready for your fall fall you know planting and then they have a fall planting that's going to turn around and work well with that spring planting so it's basically a one-two punch to try to get the you know best combination of building soil and having good you know food for wildlife so i'm very excited about that again hopefully here in the next couple weeks i'll be able to get one of them on to talk about that seed blend all right so so yeah so that planning will be coming up here uh, probably right around the first week of august that's typically what i like to you know shoot for it worked pretty good the past couple years of that time frame now it can be a week early or it can be a week late it really just depends on hopefully there's a good uh, timing for a good down you know down downpour of rain somewhere in the forecast during that basically two week window i like to shoot right for that august 1st time frame if it's a few days prior a few days after that's fine but it seems to really give the you know the plants especially those brassicas just the right amount of time to get develop create nice big bulbs on them because last year it worked out almost it's probably the best food plot that i had done since i started it and I basically had some remains of bulbs from the brassicas. Even after the snow melt, you know, I thought that they were kind of, kind of sit in the sit in the field and rot. But basically, when I came back a couple weeks later, it looks like all the wildlife had cleaned up all the remaining bulbs that were either partially eaten or had been missed. Um, so they basically cleared the table uh, when I went to go go and prep the ground for the spring blend. So basically, I'm going to do it the same as I usually do. I'm going to have my seed, any fertilizer, which I'm still unfortunately waiting on my soil sample results. What I called over to Ward Labs, who does, you know, basically they do an array of different soil samples. I did their soil health assessment. Uh, so this is basically going to tell me 
a lot more than just my NP and K. It's going to break down a lot more of the minerals and basically give me a good breakdown of how the soil is looking overall. But hopefully I get those results in, in time so I can make sure I have any fertilizer uh, that I'm needing or if I need to supplement with any like lime or anything like that. I shouldn't need it because uh, the pH has been right in the right window, but you never know from year to year. So basically you're going to have my seed, my fertilizer, everything ready to go. Borrow my father in laws tractor again, hook my sprayer up to it, spray herbicide, or actually back up. Going to sp spread out my seed, just be basically broadcasting it out there. Spray the vegetation that's in, in the food plot. Roll over it with a culture packer to knock everything down along with the, the chemicals. Basically doing a chemical burn and knocking it down to lay it flat, create a nice little mulch for those new seeds. And then should be good to go uh, for this year. Again, expanded it a little bit. I ran about two acres last year. I did extend it to about three acres this year. You know, basically just trying to get a little more out of it and best be able to provide just a little bit more food uh, for the deer and wildlife. I also need to work on uh, basically moving my deer blind. Where I had it before, it worked really good for, well, let's just say, I think I got it a little too close to where the deer are coming from. You know, essentially they come from directly behind me in some instances, which is not necessarily all that bad for archery season. But the potential is, is that you're going to start spooking deer a lot more. You're basically right right in where they're potentially bedding or very, very close to it. So a lot of times you can be spooking deer. So I'm going to be moving that off to the side of the food plot a little bit. Make it not as a good of a spot for uh, archery season, but it's going to be far better for when it comes to rifle season or muzzleloader or anything like that. Or if, even for the late season, basically I'll be able to like, sneak into it, not disrupt the primary part of the farm or one of the main you know trails or corridors that they're coming through also need to work on getting some proper windows put in it uh, basically i kind of finagled some windows that are you know basically flip off with just some plywood unfortunately you know with the weathering of the wood and everything like that it's starting to tweak and twist a little bit it's not sealing up properly i'm gonna try to work on sealing it up insulating it a little bit because uh, another big issue is uh, especially when it comes time to well get into that early fall period a lot of wasps and bees and whatnot decide to make that place home uh, so it's just kind of kind of scary when you go to go with get into your uh, uh, blind and whatnot especially if you're doing you know for that early uh, antler season or taking the kids out for the youth season at all when you open that blind up and you're surrounded by wasps or bees so I'm gonna work on sealing that up a little bit moving to a better location so that's another project that needs to get done also worked on quite a bit of doing some cutting and remo removing of invasives basically the entire length of my food plot cut back about 10 yards of the overgrown brush and uh, you know, trees and invasives that were starting to encroach onto the field. So cut that back, set that back quite a bit, basically doing what would be considered edge feathering. So basically going to taper off a little bit from the hardwood line to where the field edge is and just have a little bit of in between. So there's going to be some grasses, weeds, some small brush and whatnot that's going to slowly start to regen and grow back in there. Just kind of give it a nice little taper. You know, the idea with that is to basically not let the you know wood line encroach into the field but also creates that nice edge that deer are going to feel comfortable being in there so they might step out of the thicker you know thicker woods step a little bit more into that field edge because they feel a little bit secure because of that that regen and whatnot growing up they might still feel secure in there before they actually step out in the main part of the field so you can see them step into that you can see them traveling through there when that soft edge of course, deer are creatures of edge, so if you create a nice edge for them, they're going to travel back and forth along that. Now, let's get into basically getting stuff set up for archery season. You know, going bow season, you know, I, I put a lot of time and effort into, you know, preparing for archery season. 
um, you know, it's just, it's a, I don't know. I find archery season a little bit more fun. Um, and you know, primarily too, cause you get out there, get in the woods a little bit sooner than if you had to wait for a rifle season. So getting ready for that. Like I said, I changed up my, my arrow setup. You know, I'm still have the same arrows. I'm still shooting the gold tip airstrikes. I really like those arrows. They're very, very tough. I mean, even during the Toll Archer Challenge, I shot into, well, I had a couple bad shots. And uh, one, I overshot the target. It, it landed into a log behind the target. I was able to dig that arrow out. I was able to shoot the whole rest of the day with it. Um, and even down to the next day. Another time, I basically aimed a little bit too far to the left or right end up putting the arrow right through basically a one inch you know sapling essentially split it right in half drove the arrow all the way to the fletchings was able to use a knife pry it you know that split in the tree a little bit slide my arrow out again no damage to the arrow um, you know basically they part of it is because they have aluminum collars both on the on the front of the arrow as well as the back of the arrow and that I think helps quite a bit of making sure that that integrity around the insert and your knock uh, is stronger than than if you didn't have it. So, and again, I'm just a really big fan of those arrows. They're kind of a premium arrow, so usually I don't have to worry about the straightness of them. You, know, you do a spin test, pretty much every one of them are spinning perfectly. I haven't even done a spin test on one and saw one that you know had a wobble to it. You know, these are very good arrows. But the other thing is too, during that, during your Toll Archer Challenge, you know, I had set up the arrows, the heaviest I've ever had them. You know, basically I've got the total arrow weight, it was 636 or 635 uh, grain weight. And I, you know, it wouldn't be so bad either, but I have a 27 and a half inch draw. So I don't have a lot of draw length to have a lot of power within my bow. So even my bow now is already a little bit shooting a little bit more inefficiently because I'm not allowing that full length of the cam to work for me. So by having that such a heavy arrow, you know, basically when I recited in with this new heavy arrow, you know, I basically couldn't have gone any heavier and have a sight tape that worked for my dial sight. You know, they basically just, you know, I was at the end of what they have available for sight tapes. And then I did those two shooting, you know, especially some of those longer shots at the TAC event that I was having very significant arc um, in my trajectory of, you know, shooting. You know, there's a lot of times where I was clipping overhead branches when other guys were just zipping underneath of them. And then... So I kind of took that in consideration, thinking that maybe I should light it up, lighten up my arrow. But, you know, I thought maybe, you know what, I'm just going to leave it well enough alone. A friend of mine um, was talking about, you know, basically asking, you know, got brought up of, you know, talking about uh, momentum and the uh, potential for penetration of my arrow setup. Uh, basically brought up a thing called slugs, which I had no idea what that meant. So looked into it a little bit and started doing some math and basically looked at you know how many slugs it was basically it takes in consideration if i remember the calculation uh basically kind of similar to like momentum where you're looking at you know the mass and the speed so then i started breaking down of okay what is the momentum of my arrow setup and then also what is the kinetic energy and basically looking at some math and realized that because of how heavy my arrow setup and my limitation because of my draw length and the bow poundage that I actually had a diminished gains by going so heavy of an arrow. So basically doing some, some math and determined that if I lighten up my arrow setup a little bit, I could actually get more kinetic energy and also still maintain a very high momentum. So basically looking at, I can increase my arrow speed and actually increase as well my potential for penetration because I basically married the best combination of weight and speed together 
at least for what my bow setup can be. So lighten it up about 50 grains. So I changed out my steel inserts to the standard aluminum inserts. Still kept my 200 grain uh, point. And so now I basically got a lighter, faster flying arrow that because of the increased speed and the weight is still up, I'm actually still very high in my potential for good penetration. So ultimately I dropped back down to about 576 grains. And then I started playing around. Like I said, I got some broadheads from Vantage Point Archery and basically I went back to a three blade setup. You know, two blade uh, with the uh, Magnus broadheads I used last year. I liked them. They, you know, certainly with that two blade setup is, you know, it's kind of one of the ideal things if you're looking for penetration, but they are kind of tricky to sharpen, you know, especially if you haven't really done it before. So I kind of want to make things simple again. I went back to a three blade, which is much easier to sharpen. And then I actually, like I said, I went very heavy with the broadhead. It's 200 grain broadhead. And I wanted to basically just kind of push the limit. So I got the wider cut uh, three blade that they offered. So it's instead of, you know, typically what you see is like an inch and an eighth or an inch and a sixteenth uh, cutting diameter. This is an inch and a quarter. So it's a very large uh, fixed blade, um, all things considered. So I put it on my current setup and actually I might have you know, kind of touched base on this a little bit where I had to change out basically my fletchings. The fletchings I had with my two blade setup, there basically wasn't enough resistance to help control the arrow. There's basically more uh, of a sail on the front of the arrow than I did have on the back. So I had some flight issues, increased, uh, basically went to a much larger vein configuration that, that corrected it. And that's why I ended up shooting for tag. I basically used that larger fletching. And, you know, of course, with field points during the 3D shoot, uh, flew just fine. Then I wanted to look at uh, going to a, a little bit smaller cutting diameter for the fixed blade. So I did go down to their smaller inch and eighth cut. And with that, I was able to lower back down the size on my fletchings as, as well again. So I went with a little bit lighter fletching to give me just a little bit more clearance around my cables and also gave me a little bit better front of center because of those fletchings being just a little bit lighter. And also having those smaller fletchings did quiet down the arrows a little bit because they're not you know cutting through the air as much, not making as much noise. So ultimately with, then you set up with a smaller cutting diameter broadhead, smaller fletchings, lighter arrow that has just as much potential for penetration. I'm pretty sure that's about the best arrow setup I could possibly get. Uh, I even practiced a little bit, of course, shooting some of those fixed blades, making sure they're flying okay. And I, I even posted on Instagram of where with these broadheads and then my arrow weight and speed, it was actually blasting out the back side of my block target. Now I got the one where it's got the, the layered foam in the middle and then the molded foam on the outside. So they're very good at stopping uh, arrows as they're cutting through. And it, every shot where the broadhead was sticking out the back side of that, of that target. So certainly the potential for very good penetration uh, while hunting is gonna be up there. So, and I did get some more arrows. So I'm gonna be going through, again, going through my process of arrow tuning them. I've got the inserts installed. I've got my knocks in place. I just need to go out, shoot them, make sure I do the knock tuning, get them flying as straight as I can without any fletchings to help them out, glue on my fletchings, and then I'm good to go with another half dozen arrows ready to go for hunting season. What else are we doing? So the next thing is really starting to get out and get my cameras in place. So I just put my cameras out down on the farm. There's a couple spots that I've scouted on public land that I've talked about before where 
you know, a little bit of me likes the kind of the unknown of not putting cameras out on state land, but I don't know. This year, I want the advantage of kind of knowing what's out there in some of these spots that I want to hunt. So I am going to put some cameras out. Again, I'm always kind of hesitant because you always hear, you know, people that get trail cameras stolen. So I bought some really cheap ones. So if they kind of go missing, then it's not a total loss for me. But I'm going to put some cameras out in some of the spots. There are a couple new spots as well that I want to try scouting. Uh, there's one I'm really excited to get into. You know, basically just been kind of watching some videos and Dan Info was talking about uh, what he calls oxbows or oxbows, where it's basically like little peninsulas or little islands uh, along waterways and whatnot, where it's just kind of like an isolated, um, like outcropping. And he said a lot of times you'll find, you know, a lot of, you know, bucks or, you know, deer will be bedded in those areas. And I found a couple areas uh, near the places where I hunt that, look like they're prime for deer to be bedding in them you know basically it's right next to the river it's got some thick cover and then not too far away are some uh crop fields i don't know exactly what they've got growing in it this year i gotta go, go kind of drive around and see what, exactly what's in them but there's ag fields nearby so the idea is hopefully to be able to scout that out, put some cameras in some of the main trails or some of those areas that look like deer might be bedding and let them soak for a couple months uh, to see what's going on. But I'm really hopeful that this spot has some deer in it. Uh, hopefully some good bucks in the, in the area and be able to uh, essentially kind of catch them in transition or catch them coming back. So the idea will be to... You know set up in between where the, i think they're betting or where they you know where i've determined that they're betting based on scouting or think they're betting anyways i guess i should say and then where i'm pretty sure they're going to head to those egg fields for feeding now again of course i'm going to be looking for hopefully find some potential uh, like oak trees or fruit trees or something that's you know or some other food source that could be browsing on on the way to those big egg fields so i can try to capitalize on those as well but i'm going to like, hopefully check that out here uh, hopefully within the next couple weeks and try to capitalize on you know maybe potentially catching deer coming from bedding to their food source in the evening or even maybe look at grabbing the boat or the canoe or something and then you know basically cross the river and catch these deer uh, coming back to their bedding um, in the morning so Ideally, I'd like to be able to cut them off before they get to their bedding. Uh, but we'll kind of have to see if I can pull that off or whatnot based on the scouting and, you know, access to be able to get the boat in and stuff like that. But that's another thing that I'm going to get, again, get kind of aggressive with to try to, you know, make it happen to where I get a, you know, a good buck on public land this year. I can't, again, I came close last year a few times. And I'm just trying to step my game up just a little bit more to be able to pull it off. And then also just got a email saying that I was successful to, or I did draw a tag for South Dakota again. So I'm pretty excited about that. Now, unfortunately, my buddy who also put in for it, you know, he hadn't gotten an email yet. So I'm, I'm fingers crossed that he has also drawn a tag because um, I really hate for him to not draw one this year because last year when he came out he had he was unsuccessful as well um, so I'd hate for it to be two years in a row that you know he he said he still wants to come out but I would love for him to be able to you know hunt as well and not just you know to kind of tag along with that so hopefully he gets a notification technically they weren't supposed to announce it until the fifth anyways so hopefully he just hasn't gotten this email yet and that he does draw um, that way we can both kind of, uh, do the hunt together and, you know, kind of, you know, take turns essentially. So got that going on. And then I don't know. I mean, like I said, it's been just a busy few weeks and, you know, honestly looking forward, you know, we don't have too much longer until, until it's hunt season again. So, you know, certainly trying not to procrastinate, try not to lose track of time uh, because it's going to be here before we know it. And, you know, it's, I don't know. 
it just feels like it's going to sneak up on me. I'm trying to be as proactive as I can and get ready. I think that's about it for my ramblings for this episode. Um, again, this kind of covers some of the stuff that I'm planning on doing. Hopefully that sparks some you know, motivation or things to think about for yourself to get yourself prepared for the season. So, so I think that's going to wrap it up. Again, have a fun, safe 4th of July. You know, get out there, be safe, and have fun. And that's it. My old man, sad old man, spent his life living off the land. Dirty hands and a clean soul. It breaks his heart seeing foreign cars filled with fuel. It is an eye. Come